Thank you, Stefan. Um, so my name is Robert Haas, as he said. I'm the VP and Chief Database Scientist at EDB. Today my topic is actually understanding and fixing auto vacuum. So I'm going to start with a very quick overview of how it works. Um, and then I'm going to spend a little bit longer talking about how it fails. And then I'm going to spend the most time talking about how to understand exactly what has gone wrong and how to fix it. And I realize that this is a slightly dangerous strategy for a talk because if I don't provide enough uh, introduction in the beginning sections of the talk, then you may have trouble understanding what comes later. But on the other hand, if I spend too much time on the introductory sections, we won't actually get to anything interesting before uh, the session is over. So uh, this is the strategy that I'm going to try, and I would love for you to all let me know when you put up your talk feedback how well you think that worked out. Um, so here we go. How does it work? Uh, the first thing that we should really try to keep in mind as we're thinking about this topic is that vacuum and auto vacuum are different things. In fact, they're different kinds of things. Vacuum is an SQL command. You can run it in any way that you run any other SQL command from PSQL or pgadmin or whatever tool that you like to use. It happens to be an SQL command that performs certain maintenance operations, but fundamentally the kind of thing it is, is an SQL command. Now auto vacuum, on the other hand, is a set of background processes whose job it is to automatically run the va vacuum command and the analyze command for you. So I will try to remember to say vacuum when I mean vacuum and auto vacuum when I mean auto vacuum as we go through this talk. Uh, obviously, when people are speaking about this casually, it's very common to sort of blur the distinction between the two. But when you're trying to get this clear in your head, I think it's really helpful to try to preserve the distinction as far as possible, so that's what I'm going to try to do. So that said, what does vacuum, the SQL command, do? Um, basically, it has three main functions. First of all, it recycles space that is consumed by deleted rows and by old versions of updated rows because when you delete data, it's not really gone. Now, someone might point out that there are other mechanisms in place that also help with this space recycling, and that is true, but we're gonna be just focused on the big picture here, and the big picture is that vacuum is an essential part of this process. You need to have vacuuming happening, or your tables and indexes are going to bloat. They are going to become unreasonably large compared to the amount of data that they actually contain. The second thing that vacuum does is it allows for the reuse of transaction IDs, which we call XIDs, and of multi-transaction IDs, or MXIDs. And here again, there's a whole discussion that we could have about what these values are, but what we really need to understand for purposes of this talk is that they are a limited resource and you don't want to run out. And in order to not run out, you need vacuum to be making uh, the ones that were used a long time ago reusable so that you can use them again. If that doesn't happen, then you are eventually going to run out of one or the other kinds of these IDs, and your system is going to stop accepting either some right transactions if you run out of MX IDs, or all right transactions if you run out of X IDs. You probably won't enjoy that very much if it happens to you. The third thing that vacuum does is it updates the visibility map for tables. And that has the effect of making future vacuum operations more efficient. It also has the effect of making your index only scans more efficient. If this doesn't get done, the consequences are generally a lot less serious than for the first two things. Having your database grow out of control is really bad. Not accepting right transactions or even certain kinds of right transactions is really bad. Having your index-only scans be slow is 
probably less bad, maybe not bad at all, if your workload doesn't happen to rely on that particular feature. The overall point that I want you to absorb from this slide is that if you don't run vacuum regularly, or if it fails to accomplish the tasks that it is intended to accomplish, really bad things are going to happen to your database. Uh, if you're not yet convinced of that, based on what I put on this slide, uh, then I guess you'll have to go to another talk which is more specifically about uh, why all of those bad things happen, or uh, have some bad real-world experiences, but that's as much as I'm going to say about why it's bad if you don't vacuum. So then let's talk about how auto vacuum works, this auto vacuum system. The auto vacuum system makes use of two different kinds of processes. There is an auto vacuum launcher process which normally runs all the time with some exceptions that we're not really going to discuss in this talk. Um, and basically all the auto vacuum launcher processes knows is what databases you have. It maintains a list of all of the databases in your PostgreSQL instance. And it arranges to regularly start an auto vacuum worker process in each one of those databases. And the auto vacuum worker processes have all of the real smarts in this area. Those processes look at the statistics for each table in the database, um, and they make a decision about whether vacuum should be run, or whether analyze should be run, or both, or neither and then whatever they decide needs to be done, they do it. Then they exit, and eventually the launcher process is gonna start another worker process in that database, and another worker process in that database, and another worker process uh, in that database. So that's the system. Now, how can things go off the rails? Well, one thing to understand here is that what auto vacuum is coded to do and what we want it to do are unfortunately somewhat different from each other. As users, we're just hoping it's gonna make our problems go away. We want it to maintain the database with low bloat and plenty of available XIDs and plenty of available MXIDs and an up-to-date free space map and all the things. The maintenance that vacuum is supposed to do, we want that to happen at the times when it needs to happen, to not happen at the times when it doesn't need to happen. We're hoping for a great outcome here. But auto vacuum isn't that smart. It doesn't have any AI. What it has are a set of configurable thresholds, and it judges whether those thresholds have been met. And depending on whether they have or not, it either takes action or it doesn't. So if those thresholds are not configured in a way that is appropriate for the system, then auto vacuum may work correctly in the sense that it's doing exactly what it was coded to do, but it may fail to achieve your goal, which is to have your database keep working. Um, so that's kind of how the auto vacuum system can go wrong. But then also any problem with the commands that it runs can also cause things to go wrong. It's just a system for running vacuum and analyze. So any problems with those commands are also going to potentially have negative results. So what can go wrong there? For the most part, the problems come from running the vacuum command rather than running the analyze command. And that's simply because the vacuum command does something more complicated and it uses more resources. So there are more opportunities for things to go wrong. Um, but in general, these commands have the same failure modes as other commands. For example, anytime you run an SQL command, it, it could fail with some error message due to some problem. And here, what will happen in that case is AutoVacuum will just try that command again, and again, and again, and again, and maybe one of those retries is going to succeed because maybe whatever error you got was the result of some temporary condition, or maybe not, in which case it's just gonna keep erroring out until somebody fixes something. That might be you, that might be me. Um, another thing that that command could do is run forever and never complete. And in that case, 
the table where that command is running forever is not ever going to get successfully vacuumed because you can only have one vacuum running in a table at a time, and if it doesn't finish, that table never finishes getting vacuumed. And maybe it'll be even worse than that. Maybe some other tables are also now not going to get vacuumed because if vacuum, auto vacuum is tied up trying to run a vacuum of this table, that same process cannot at the same time be trying to run a vacuum of some other table. So the problems could spread from one table that has an issue to other places. Uh, or vacuum could run for a really long time, in which case we have the same kinds of problems as if it's running forever. Uh, and, then, and all of those things that I just talked about, those are really things that could happen for various reasons to any command that you run. You could run a select query and have it fail or run forever or run for a really long time. There's one more pro kind of problem here, which is somewhat specific to vacuum, and that is maybe it will finish successfully and in a reasonable amount of time, but maybe nothing really happens that is very useful. And so then we just try it again and again and again and again, and we keep wasting resources on an operation that is not helping. Um, we'll talk more about why this happens and what to do about it later in the talk, but right now I just want to get the list of problems out there. Now, those are problems with running the command. Let's turn back to the auto vacuum system for a minute. The system itself is very reliable. It has a lot of error handling. It has a lot of retry loops. It's not as smart as you want, but because it's so simple, the thing that it does, it really does it. It does not just stop doing that thing for some crazy reason. Uh, one thing that I see fairly commonly is that people have the idea that vacuuming is bad, and so they try to keep auto vacuum from doing it. Uh, and sometimes they try to use like a really blunt instrument, like setting auto vacuum equals off in the configuration file. Um, or sometimes they try to be a little bit more clever, and they're like, well, I'll, I'll set auto vacuum nap time to one day instead of the default of one minute. So instead of trying to run an auto vacuum worker in every database every minute, we'll just try to run, run one every day. Um, with these kinds of unreasonable configuration settings, you end up having a lot of problems. The system is not going to perform uh, as it's supposed to if you deliberately interfere with it. Assuming that you don't do that, typically the problem that occurs in the auto vacuum system itself is that it is confused about which tables need to be vacuumed. It either thinks the table needs to be vacuumed when act that's actually not the case, or uh, it thinks the table doesn't need to be vacuumed when it really does. So summarizing all of that, we have five S's. Vacuum might be slow. It might be stuck. It might be spinning, hitting the same table over and over and over again. It might be skipping a table. Uh, or you might have vacuum starvation, where the system is just too busy and the amount of work that needs to be done exceeds the capacity of the system, and so some work does not get done. Hopefully that makes sense so far. Um, now we're going to go through these in more detail. Anybody want to ask a question before we do that? Okay. Either I've lost none of you or all of you. <laughs> so let's talk about the vacuum slow or stuck case. Um, these cases are very similar in some ways because the user visible symptom is the same. What the user typically perceives in this kind of situation is vacuum seems to be running forever on my table. Why? Well, one possible reason is that some users have a very impatient notion of what running forever means, right? If you've got a terabyte table, and you're running on a tiny system, it is going to take a while to get through that table, no matter what you do. Um, so you should always consider the possibility that there's no actual problem here. Your table is really big, there's a lot of work to do, and it's going to take a while. Um, but the most common reason why I see this problem is that vacuum has been told to run slowly 
and it, has, it is obeying the command which it has been given by your PostgreSQL.conf file. And therefore, it takes a long time. We'll talk much more about this in a few slides because this happens to people all the time. There are a few other causes of this that I want to mention, which I won't be going into more detail about, but I do want to call them out here uh, because you may see them. One is that vacuum might be waiting for some other PostgreSQL process to complete some operation. And if that's the case, then you need to kill off the process that's trying to perform that other operation so that it gets out of the way of vacuum and vacuum can proceed. Now, I know what at least one person in this room is thinking. At least one of you out there is thinking, well, why don't I kill off the auto vacuum so that the other thing can proceed? And the answer to that question is that auto vacuum is a very reliable system. It runs vacuum on your tables when it thinks that that is needed. And if it thought that that was needed before and you kill the process, it's going to still think that it's needed and it's going to do it again, possibly extremely quickly after you do it, like five seconds. So killing off the vacuum tends to fail to solve this kind of problem. You need to get the other thing out of the way. Another reason why this could be happening is that your disk might be too slow. Maybe you didn't buy quite enough hardware for whatever it is that you're trying to do. Or, and I've seen this one a few times, maybe your disk is about 6 to 48 hours from kicking the bucket. And it used to be fast, but today it's really slow for some reason. And tomorrow the speed is going to quite possibly be exactly zero. Um, so this is something to watch out for. Another thing that occasionally happens to people, it's not common, but I have seen it, um, is that you might have corrupted indexes due to any of the many possible causes of database corruption. Hardware bugs, software bugs, Linux kernel bugs, PostgreSQL bugs, you doing backup and restore wrong, that's a very common one. All kinds of reasons why you can end up with a corrupted database. Um, and then you can get into an infinite loop. This can really only happen with the indexes, not with the table, because when we process the table, we start with the first page of the table and we keep going page by page by page by page until we get to the last page of the table and then we're done. So that can't go forever. It can only go for a long time if your table is really big. But when we vacuum the indexes, we process them in logical order. That means every page we look at, we say, we look at that page and it tells us what page to go to next. And then that page tells us what page to go to after that, and so on. And that should be a chain that starts at one end and goes forward page by page until we get to the other end. But those pointers could loop if you have database corruption. And if that happens, then Vacuum will find that loop and go around in a circle until you do something about it. Uh, Usually that something is dropping the index or re-indexing the index. Maybe in an ideal world, this would involve like restoring from an uncorrupted backup or failing over to an unaffected standby, but a lot of people seem to prefer the more targeted solution of just dropping that index and hoping they don't have corruption anywhere else. Hope, the great friend of the DBA. So you might wonder, given that there are a number of possible causes of this kind of problem, how do you tell which one you have? Um, there are three things that I can recommend in this situation. Um, probably the simplest one is to use TOP or PS or whatever tool you like to use to look at whether the auto vacuum process is consuming I.O. time or CPU time. Right away, you can rule some explanations in or out. If the process is not doing anything, if it seems to be sitting there, that might suggest some kind of explanation that involves it waiting for something. If it sits there for a really long time and does absolutely zero useful things, that is extremely likely to be waiting for some external event to occur. If it's consuming lots of CPU time, you're obviously not just stuck at a wait. Something is happening, it's just taking too long. 
To get a better sense of what's going on here, I find it very useful to look in the PGSTAT activity system view and to look at the wait event type column and the wait event column. That will often give you a very specific idea of what the problem may be. It is important to understand that these columns update instantly. So you probably want to check the view a few times and see if you're consistently getting the same kinds of results rather than relying only on a single sample. And then a third thing that you can do uh, is look at PGSTAT progress vacuum, which will tell you which phase of processing this particular vacuum is in. For example, if you think, oh, I probably have an infinite loop in one of my indexes, and then you go and look at PGSTAT progress vacuum, and it says, actually, I'm doing the table portion of the vacuum, not the index portion of the vacuum. Well, your theory has been ruled out. Um, of all of these methods, I would say looking at the weight event and the weight event type one is probably like my favorite, the easiest way to get to a solution in both cases, in most cases, rather. Um, if you are seeing a lot of vacuum delay weight events, that means vacuum has been configured to run too slow, and it is delaying itself repeatedly. If you see a lot of I.O. weight events, well, okay, your disk is not able to keep up with the amount of I.O. that has been generated. Um, having PostgreSQL be faster than your hardware is an extremely popular feature request, but unfortunately not one that I figured out how to implement as of this time. So by now, you're probably wondering, how do I make vacuum run faster? Because you keep mentioning this thing uh, about it not being configured to run fast enough. Uh, there are two main parameters in PostgreSQL.conf that you can use for this purpose. Uh, you can either raise vacuum cost limit, uh, or you can reduce vacuum, auto vacuum vacuum cost delay. Um, I recommend the first one. Basically, the system does an amount of work, which is defined by the cost limit and then it waits for an amount of time which is defined by the cost delay, and then that cycle repeats. So you either need to increase the amount of work between sleeps or make the sleeps shorter. But if you make the, sheeps, the sleeps shorter, um, then you might run into some operating system dependent behavior because operating systems don't always give you the exact sleep time that the process requests. And also, if you're trying to do something like increase the cost limit by a factor of 7x, it's pretty easy to take 200 and multiply by 7, but if the cost delay is measured in some whole number of milliseconds and you try to divide it by 7, then you get really confused and have like a lot of decimal places and things like that. So for me, just doing it with the, the cost limit makes it a lot easier to understand what's going on, but you could do either one. Um, it is important to realize that the value that you need for that vacuum cost limit increases as your database gets larger and busier. Version 12 provided a lot of relief in this area by increasing the default setting by a factor of 10. We should have increased the default setting quite a while ago because hardware has gotten so much faster and Postgres workloads have gotten so much bigger, but it didn't happen. So we got uh, under-rotated here in terms of where the world is at and we did a big increase uh, in version 12. So now the default settings allow more than 100 gigabytes of auto vacuuming per hour, uh, which is usually enough. The old settings were considerably slower. So if you're running an older version, or if you've carried your configuration file forward from an older version to a newer version, you're much more likely to have a problem in this area. But even with the new defaults, if you have very big tables and a very busy database, you could need to crank this up and you could need to crank it up very significantly. If you're seeing a lot of vacuum delay weight events, you have this problem, and you need to resolve it for your system to start working well. Um, the value of this cost limit is shared across all workers. So if you raise auto vacuum max workers, each individual worker goes slower. And this actually often messes people up because instead of raising the cost limit, which is what they should be doing, they, actually, they raise the number of workers instead. And that actually often does the exact opposite of what they were hoping, because now they have more workers, each individual one running slower, which does not help them get their big tables vacuumed quickly. 
raising the cost limit does have that effect, and that's usually what you want to do. Um, before version 16, if you changed the cost limit, it did not take effect for auto vacuum workers that were already running. So what I keep having to tell people who run into this problem on older versions and need to get an auto vacuum that's already in progress going faster is you can hook up GDB to the process that is having the vacuum, auto vacuum process that's having the issue. You can use the debugger to set the vacuum cost active Boolean to false, and then boom, that worker will accelerate to maximum speed instantly, and uh, you'll only be limited by your hardware for that process after that. Uh, this is a good trick that I have used to help many people who find themselves in this kind of situation, but it's obviously a nasty hack that you don't want to have to do on production, and that's why Melanie deserves huge props for making the system able to actually respond uh, to these kinds of changes on the fly. Uh, starting at version 16, you'll just be able to raise the cost limit, reload the configuration, and away you go. Um, that, I, I think that's a huge improvement. Maybe that's because I spent too much time helping people with bad auto vacuum settings, but it is really a good change. So let's talk about vacuum spinning. Um, here, the user visible symptom is different. Instead of seeing uh, one vacuum running on a table forever, you see a series of vacuums running on that table over and over again. And even more than in the previous case, you should really consider the possibility that this is normal. Your table might just be experiencing a lot of write activity, and so it needs a lot of vacuum, and so vacuum is running a lot. That is OK. Uh, but there are a couple of scenarios that you want to watch out for here. Um, one possibility is that vacuum is failing with some kind of an error, and auto vacuum, being the obedient servant that it is, keeps retrying it. This is actually, in some ways, a good scenario. I mean, it's bad in the sense that something really bad is probably happening to your database cluster really quickly, so you're not going to enjoy that. But you have an error message. It doesn't just say error in the log. There is some message there that will at least give you a clue what the problem is. And if that error message says something like I.O. error, well, you may not like it, but at least you know where to go looking for the problem. Um, the other kind of reason why this tends to occur is that auto vacuum and vacuum do not agree with each other about whether your table actually needs vacuuming or not. And the reason why this happens is that auto vacuum is approximating. Vacuum itself knows the real answer. So if auto vacuum's approximation makes it think that your table needs vacuuming, Vacuum may run and go, no work here, no work here, no work here, no work here, no work here. OK, I'm done. Out of vacuum looks and goes, huh, nothing seems to have changed. Run that guy again. No work here, 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 done. This is clearly a very frustrating situation because you're just wasting a lot of system resources and nothing is improving. Um, in my experience, the reason why this usually happens is because you've got either a long-running transaction or something that's effectively equivalent to that uh, running on your system. So it may actually be a long-running transaction. You should check PG stat activity. Uh, if you've got some really long-running transaction on your system, then the, any old data that would hypothetically be visible to that long-running transaction cannot be removed yet. So auto vacuum will not be able to clean that data out of your table, so your table may be full of bloat, but it's bloat that can't be removed yet because it could hypothetically still be needed by your long-running transaction, so you got to get rid of that guy. Likewise, you could have an old prepared transaction. The system doesn't know whether that transaction is going to be rolled back or committed, so it has to remain prepared for both possibilities, which can, again, prevent data from being removed, and unfortunately, it can prevent data from being removed even from tables that are unrelated to what tables the prepared transaction touched. So you want to check PG prepared XX and resolve any unresolved prepared transactions. And then you also want to check for replication slots. I've noticed that a lot of people seem to not have fully automated failover. Uh, so they spin up new standbys, they take standbys down, they fail over, and sometimes they forget about updating the replication slots and everything seems fine for a day or a week or a month depending on how busy their system is, but
but in the background, that replication slot is still there, and all of the data that that replication slot might need is still hanging around just in case that now non-existent standby comes back from the dead and wants to use that slot. This is so common, I can't even get over it. <laughs> you need to make sure you remove your replication slots when they're no longer used, or terrible, terrible things are going to happen to you. Uh, and so then we'll move on to the third category of problem, which is where vacuum starvation is happening, or vacuum is just skipping tables. And here, we have the third possible user-visible symptom, which is vacuum is not running on my table at all. In the first two cases, it was running forever. In the second, two case, the second case, it was running repeatedly. Here, auto vacuum is ignoring the table when we, as human beings, know that it should be paying attention to that table. In that case, we have either the starved problem or we have the skipped problem. And we need to tell the difference. And the easiest way to do that, in my experience, is to check PGStat activity. Look at the workers, see how many are running, see how long they've been running. Compare that to your configured value for auto vacuum max workers. The default value of auto vacuum max workers is three, which means you can have three auto vacuum processes running at a time. If you check PGStat activity in this kind of situation, and you find that you have three workers running, and they've all been running for at least 12 hours, there's a very good chance that your problem is starvation. Other tables aren't being reached because all of your workers are already busy doing stuff, and therefore they can't do other stuff. If, on the other hand, you see no auto vacuum workers running, where there's one running and it's been running for five minutes, or even there's one running and it's been running for you know, 12 hours, well, then you still theoretically have two more that are free. Or if they're all in use, but they've all started in the last few minutes, well, they're probably, that's, you're probably not starved. It's probably that the table is getting skipped. So these two kinds of problems we need to distinguish from each other, and then we can talk about how to fix each one. So let's talk about the starvation case, where we can see that auto vacuum is probably just not reaching the table because it's too busy doing other things. In that case, there is no problem with this particular table. Rather, the problem is with overall capacity. And the solutions here are very, very similar to the case where vacuum is slow. Mainly, raise that cost limit. Push it up. If you need to, push it way up. Don't be shy. You normally want to avoid making radical changes to configuration settings, but resolving these kinds of problems often requires a big boost to the vacuum cost limit in order to get you out of trouble. So don't be afraid. Uh, you could, in theory, need faster hardware, but most of the time, cranking up the cost limit is going to help. The one way, in my experience, in which this kind of situation is different from the vacuum slow case is that here, raising auto vacuum max workers is much more likely to help. In the vacuum slow case, raising the max number of workers generally doesn't help and often hurts because people don't raise the cost limit at the same time. But here, it might help because it might let you do more things at the same time and therefore get to more of your tables. However, you still need to remember that if you raise the maximum number of workers, you also probably need to raise the cost limit by at least as much. If you double the number of workers, my recommendation would be probably at least double the cost limit as well. Maybe triple the cost limit, maybe more. Your cost limit, again, is your most powerful tool for helping AutoVacuum to keep up with your database. And in this situation, it isn't keeping up in your database, with your database. I've gone a little too fast, so we will have good time for questions. That's OK. Um, on the other hand, if you figure out that vacuum is skipping your table, that's a different kind of problem. Here, there is a problem with that specific table. The superficial symptom is the same. Auto vacuum is ignoring a table that it shouldn't be ignoring, but the reason is different. It's not skipping it because it's too busy elsewhere. It's skipping it because it doesn't think anything is needed. Um, I've seen this problem happen for a couple of different reasons. Um, one reason is that if it's a big table, 
you might need to reduce a parameter called auto vacuum vacuum scale factor. Um, the default value is 0 0.2, which in my experience is good for small tables, but is sometimes too big for large tables. So if you have a big table and it doesn't seem to be getting vacuumed enough, and so it's bloating, uh, then you might consider cranking down the scale factor. The good news here is that most of the settings I've been talking about, and this one in particular, can be configured on a per-table basis. So you don't necessarily need to reduce auto vacuum vacuum scale factor for your entire system. You can just reduce it for specific tables, probably your big tables. You could reduce it to 0.1 or 0.05 or 0.02 or whatever value gets you enough vacuuming on that table to keep the size of the table under control. Um, it's also a really good idea to check whether anybody else might have applied some custom configuration settings to the particular table that's causing the problem. Um, more than once, I've discovered that the table that isn't getting vacuumed, somebody set auto vacuum enabled equals false on that table. And then that person uh, left the building or, you know, whatever. Uh, and, huh, that table is getting really big for some reason. Yeah, it's getting really big because it's not getting vacuumed. It's not getting vacuumed because you told it not to vacuum it. Um, so definitely a good idea to check for any unusual configuration parameters uh, on that table. PSQL's backslash D is, is one way of finding that information out. Um, and of course, you can also do this globally if you set auto vacuum equals false in the configuration file. So that can be another thing to check for. Um, another possible cause of this category of problem is that you might have an issue with your statistics system. All of the, most of the data that AutoVacuum is using to make decisions about whether to run vacuum or not is coming from the statistics system. So garbage in, garbage out. If the statistics system doesn't provide useful data about what is happening with your tables, then AutoVacuum won't know what to do. Um, if you think you have this problem, one thing that you can do is try a manual vacuum of the affected tables or maybe of your entire database and see if that gets things back on track. If that doesn't seem th to be getting things back on track, you might need to contact uh, an expert on this topic uh, because you might have a really weird problem. One pretty common reason why this happens is that somebody gets the bright idea that it would be a good idea to run pgstat reset. That says throw away all of my statistics. If you throw away all of your statistics, you don't have any statistics anymore. In particular, you don't have any statistics that suggest the vacuum needs to be run. Then auto vacuum will decide vacuum doesn't need to be run. And then you'll have all of the problems that come from not running vacuum. Don't run pgstat reset. Maybe propose a patch to remove that from Postgres because it is an extremely bad idea. It's an extremely bad idea. Uh, one thing that sometimes confuses the issue here is that there are various safeties built into the system that will always force auto vacuum to start doing something anyway. You, if, if you configure auto vacuum equals off, and, and then you, you know, set the nap time to a day, and then you set the scale factor to, uh, you know, 20 million, and, and you do all kinds of crazy stuff uh, to try to get auto vacuum to not run, A, you're shooting yourself in the foot, but B, eventually it will start ignoring those instructions and it will start doing stuff anyway. But by the time that happens, there is a very good chance that your system is going to be in a terrible state and that you're going to have a very lengthy recovery process to get back to a state where things work well enough that you can actually use your database system. So don't let it get to that point. Deal with problems when, they're, when, you, when they first start happening rather than just letting it go on and on and on. But also, if you come across a system that is in a really bad state, just remember that the fact that auto vacuum is running doesn't necessarily mean that the user wanted auto vacuum to run. It may merely mean that they ran past all of the safety nets and eventually the system enforced that on them. And you still need to go through the uh, activity of checking all of the configuration settings and make sure that they're sane. And there's a very good chance you're going to find out that they're not uh, and that the person has tried as hard as 
possible to postpone vacuuming. Remember, vacuuming is like exercise. If it hurts, you're not doing enough of it. Thank you very much. So great. Are there any questions? Yeah. I'm coming on my way. Just as a rem reminder, this session will be recorded. So if you are asking a question, you will be recorded too. So if you want to ask questions um, without being recorded, with the end of the talk. Hi. Is there any chance of getting auto vacuum to do um, parallel processing on a single table? That's a great question. So someone wrote and committed a patch, uh, I don't remember exactly who it was, to allow vacuum to be manually run in parallel, but auto vacuum doesn't know how to make use of that option because no one has taught it how to do that. And also the kind of parallelism that that patch gives you is not probably quite as good as what we want. So I do think that there is a chance of that happening eventually, but there's probably a reasonably decent amount of work that needs to be done in order to make that possible. Okay, did that answer your question? Cool, any other question? I realize this is probably, there's probably a very good reason for this, but I'm gonna ask anyway. Is there a reason why we don't consider Global X-Men when we are, sorry, when we are contemplating whether to go vacuum a table for wraparound purposes? That is, why do yeah, we not? Yeah, we don't, we, we, we know that, this is too technical for this sorry. large audience, but basically we, we do know the Global X-Men, but we don't know enough about the X-Men distribution in the table to do anything particularly useful with it, so. We just don't have enough data. If we knew, if we had a map of where different X Men's, a heat map of where different X Men's occurred in the table. All right. Uh, you're, I understand the question you're answering, but that's not the question I was asking. Um, what I was just trying to say is whether or not, like, there's no point going to go vacuum a table to move X Men's or to move X IDs forward if we know we can't because the global X Men is held back. So we should just right, but we skip. just, we, we don't know that. Okay. Uh, maybe we know it in some certain cases, and maybe there's a simple case that optimization that we're missing, but I think in general we just don't have the information. If this is a reply to him, okay, <laughs> reply uh, to him later. <laughs> to the point you made about PD stat reset or whatever, um, a common version of that is if you had a crash or a promotion, uh -huh. that effectively is the same thing. Uh -huh. So. That's a very common way to get into trouble, and the easiest way to get out of it is to schedule analyzing your tables afterwards with, just with an analyze, because that repopulates at least the dirty information to some degree. So I've seen that help a lot of people. So. Cool, thanks. Whenever I think about <clears throat> vacuum and auto vacuum, uh, all these buttons we have, cost limit and whatever, I feel like it's a nuclear control panel. And we add more buttons. For example, two releases ago, we added the insert scale or factor for append only tables. Um, and it's very hard to understand, even if you've been doing a lot with vacuum. Um, I was thinking we used to have wall keep segments, which was also a number. Now we have wall keep size, which is more easy to grok as a DBA, I, I can configure it as size. Is it a possibility to think about having parameters not in costs and in limits yeah, and I, in nanoseconds, but in megabytes per second? I, I'm or, pretty or? sure I proposed that idea about 10 years ago and was ah. told it was bad, but it's probably time to repropose it again because it's still a good idea even though some people think so because they're, they're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> I mean, that's... I, this wasn't, he didn't put me in the audience to ask the question, by the way. I was unaware of this. <laughs> but y yes, I think better units for some of the settings would be a great idea. You would lose some power, right? Because your cost limit is a mix of 
the the cost of touching a clean page and the cost of dirtying a page and the cost you know there's several different cost ingredients that go in there and so in, in theory that system gives you more power than 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 various other things that you might think of that are written in more reasonable units and that was the objection that was raised when I floated this on the list but of course you you've hit on the real issue which is that unless you're very good at this and maybe even then you don't know what the heck the current settings do. And so the fact that they have all of this theoretical power doesn't really help you as much as the fact that you don't understand them hurts you. So I am on board with your proposition. Okay, so maybe la one last question. Uh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, actually, okay, can I do? Two questions and one, I'll do it anyway. So uh, first, um, how reliable uh, from your perspective are the scripts we all know which measure the bloat? Because uh, I also like try to find the best one and most times, not most times, I often get complaints with just vacuum. We ran your, not mine, bloat script and it still shows that we are bloated. And related, uh, there are two scripts, one for tables, one for indices. And uh, in general, I do not have clear idea whether it has any effect on indices. I heard different answers. So. Yeah, so there are various ways of approximating how much bloat you have in your table. There's a very, f and, the, and it's basically a trade-off between speed and accuracy. There's a very old query that was written um, by Greg Sabino Mullane that's part of check postgres.pl and which has been widely copied by many other people and to many other places, which is cool, but it doesn't know about things like toast. So it just gives wrong answers, and it's heavily reliant on the data in PG Statistic, and sometimes Analyze decides not to store some of the things that that query wants, and then the query just is like, okay, I don't know, and it gives wrong answers. Um, you have PG Stat Tuple, which is the other end of the spectrum. It's quite accurate, but it's quite expensive because it has to scan the whole table. And then you have PG Stat Tuple Approx, which is somewhere in the middle, it gives a less accurate answer, but at a, at a cheaper cost. So the real sort of meat of the problem here is that it's very hard to know the exact situation that the table is in without doing a lot of work, right? So I think that there are things that could be done with enough development effort to like fix the system so that it's more feedback driven. And that like if we find that we're repeatedly vacuuming a table and not getting anywhere, maybe we remember that and we don't just stay in that vicious cycle forever. We wait till something changes before we try again. It is, I think, reasonably hard to come up with very compelling ways of addressing these problems. But on the other hand, anything would be better than what we've got right now, right? I, I think in general, you know, as far as the bloat monitoring stuff is concerned, my advice would be look at it, but don't take it as gospel. Recognize that whatever you do to detect your bloated tables is better than the majority position of doing nothing at all to detect whether your tables are bloated. And any solution that you have, no matter how stupid it is, is far superior to not having that monitoring in place. But also, uh, there are probably better and worse solutions within that space, and you can try to sort of experiment to figure out what is best for you. But unfortunately, there is no silver bullet. There's no solution which is both highly accurate and highly performant and there probably never will be um so yeah okay thank you very much for that closing word <laughs>